doing, uh, so I guess I should remind you that there's a web assign due Wednesday. You know, you know, five Wednesday. Um, okay, so what we were doing, we were uh, talking about Euler's method. And this is a way to, if you have a differential equation, so this, uh, <coughs> so we have a differential equation and we have an initial condition, then we can numerically construct a solution. just pick, so our differential equation looks something like, I don't know, y prime is, I don't know, some function that's y. So if we write our differential equation like that, and we have some initial condition like, um, uh, y of 0 is some number, either the number, um, a. So we have something like that. Then what we do is we just follow the slope field. So we pick some ratio that we like. Um, sometimes this will be told to you, sometimes you just pick something which is, so, so we pick a step size h, which is the fraction of the derivative that you're going to pay attention to. So you can take h equals 1, and this usually gives you a fairly bad, 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 fairly bad solution because you're not following it very closely, or you can take h very small. The drawback of doing h small is it'll be, it'll follow closely, but it'll be a lot of work because you have to do a lot of steps. And then you just start going. So you just take your initial x, I guess this should really be, it doesn't have to be 0, it could be x naught, but we'll just start with our initial x is 0, and our initial y is whatever it is. Uh, no, it's not a. Yeah, it is. And then we can look at what is y prime of x naught by plugging these guys in. Uh, and then that gives us, now we're going to move x ahead a little bit. It's the previous guy, plus we add a little step of h, and then assuming that everything else is true, then we take our next y to be what we had before, and then we add on some small fraction of what we got the derivative last time. And then we just keep going in this way. I didn't leave enough room. So y2 will be what we calculate here, y prime of x1. And y2 is what we got last time plus h times whatever the derivative was from last time. And so on. We just keep going until we get as far as we want. So all we're doing here in terms of a picture, if we have our differential equation here, we start at our starting point, we look at the derivative vector, and we go some distance along it. This gives us our next 
y value at our next a, at our next step size h. And then from that one, we look at the derivative vector, we go some part along it to get our next y value. And then at that one, we look at the derivative vector, maybe it goes this way, we go some distance along it, and we just keep following where it tells us to go. We're just looking at the slow field, but just in the place we're going. We could just plug this into a little machine. Very easy to write a computer program to do Euler's method, if you know how to program at all. Um, okay, so let me do an example of this. And I'm going to estimate a couple of things in this example. So, so if I have, so suppose I have like a block of clay or something. And it's at, say, 50 degrees Fahrenheit. And I'm going to put it in a kiln. At 500 degrees Fahrenheit. I'm going to bake it, and I want to know how hot will it be, so I, I suppose I know, I check after one hour the block is at 100 degrees. But now I don't want to keep checking it every hour, and I, I want to go to sleep. So I want to know what will the temperature be in six hours. So you might, if you didn't think very hard, you might say, oh well, it's going to go up 300 degrees because six hours, it goes up 50 degrees an hour. So six times 50 is 300, so it will be 400 degrees in six hours. Do you think that's right? No. So, so you have to know a little bit of, let's say, physics. So Newton's law of cooling says that the change, if I have something, if I have something at one temperature in an ambient area that's another temperature, then this is some constant, which depends on the thing, times the difference in temperatures. Uh, so in this case, it's, well, let's do it this way. T of H minus the ambient temperature. Okay, so this differential equation, in this case, I guess it's Newton's <coughs> law of heating, but this is... And we can solve this differential equation and get an explicit formula for what the solutions look like, but let's not do that yet. So now let's just use this and use Euler's method to estimate what the temperature will be in six hours. Okay? So is it clear what to do now? Okay, that's, that's good. If it was clear to you, then we could just leave. Since it's not clear, so let me go through this. And just for simplicity, I'm going to take a step size of 1. So we need to know a couple of things. We need to figure out what is this k. Uh, and we need to figure out how to use this to go ahead 6 hours in time. Okay? So first we have to guess k. Well, we, can't, we have to use the information we have to estimate k. This estimate will be wrong, but it won't be too bad. So this is not a very good solution, but it's a solution. So we have, sorry? Some number. So k is, depends on how quickly the thing absorbs heat. If it's a block of clay, it will absorb heat less quickly than, say, a metal. 
So if it's something that, that heats very slowly, K will be different than if it's something that heats fast. Right? So this depends on the material. It also, I guess, depends on the oven, whether the oven is filled with air or filled with water. Well, you can't have water at 500 degrees. Could be filled with superheated steam. Um, you know, so it's 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 something that depends on the situation. Okay, so first, how would we how would we guess how would we estimate K? I claim that most of the information needed, let's not assume that we solve it yet. You should be able to get an idea. Is, is k a tenth? Is it a hundred? Is it negative six? What would we use to figure it out? Yeah. Use the two temperatures. Right. So looking at the two temperatures, what do they tell us? We know T of 0 is 50, and we know T of 1 is 100. Why does that tell us anything about K? Yeah. I'm sorry, say that again? Find the difference? So T prime of 0 is just about 50. Yeah, it's, maybe it's 53, maybe it's 60, maybe it's 49, but it's like 50. So this tells us that T prime of 0 is kind of like T of 1 minus T of 0 over 1. Because, I mean, this is the difference quotient that you all think you took the limit of. Remember that back in the dark ages. So this is 100 minus 50 over 1, which is 50. It went up about 50 degrees in an hour. So using that, we should be able to figure out what K is, because now we know everything here. We're saying that T prime of 0 is about 50 which is k times, there's too many 50s on the board, but oh well, t of 0 minus 500. So t of 0 is 50. So that means that 50 is k times negative 450. So k, wait a minute. What did I do wrong? In my notes, k was an eighth. Now it's a ninth. Uh, well, now it seems to be a ninth, doesn't it? Huh. Negative. Okay, I don't know how I got an eighth before. because I did T of 1. Well, whatever. Okay, so K is about 50 over negative 450, which is a ninth, which is 0.111111. It's negative. So let's just use 0.1 because all of this is just slop. K is actually log 8, negative is log 8 over log 9. I mean log 8 ninths, but we don't know that yet. Okay, so using K to be negative 0 0.1111111, we can now use Euler's method to estimate what happens after was it six hours, five hours, I don't know. Some number of hours. So now I'm going to use, so now my differential equation is T prime the time in hours is negative point one one enough ones. How about let's write enough. Negative a ninth of T of H minus five hundred. 
And so now I'm going to use Euler's method to guess, to estimate what's going to happen find t of 6. So t of 0, we already know is 50. t of 1, we already know is 100. So, right, this is, oh, unfortunately I have two h's here. I have my step size h, and I have my h for hours. So unfortunately I use the same letter for the same thing. But here my step is 1. So instead of writing h, I'm just going to write 1. Because I'm being lazy. I'm using 1. So to guess what t of 2 is, what do we do? Well, this is going to be just about t of 1 plus my step size, which is 1, times the derivative at 1. Well, what's the derivative at 1? It's negative a ninth of the temperature at 1 minus 500, which is, well, I'm going to use 0.1 for a ninth. So it's about 40. I guess this is this is negative, this is negative. I'm going to forget about the negatives, right? So t of 2, what did I do wrong? Should have been 450. Sorry, this should be 450. Why? Uh, because Euler's method usually you use the previous x and y because you don't necessarily know the next x. So, so no. What am I doing? I want t prime of one. Yeah. So I, I'm sorry. This is right. This okay. This is right. This is okay. Because I did the 50 step already. Yeah, whatever the number is. It's still 40. Okay. It's like, it's actually 44. Well, a ninth is 0 0.1111111, so it's 44.44444. Um, okay. So, so this is 100 plus 44 is 144. And then the next step, the temperature at 3 is going to be the temperature at 2 plus however fraction I'm taking, 1, of the last temperature that I had, the derivative at the last time I had. So the derivative at the last time I had here is, uh, I've lost my place, 144 plus 1. Times. So the derivative at the last time is I take these two values that I had, 144 and 2, I don't need 2, and I plug them in here. So uh, 500 minus 144 is 56. Something's wrong there. I don't know. 50. <coughs> yeah. Okay. So that's 356 times 0.1111111 is, so it's 356 times 0.11, which is 39, call it 39. 144 plus 39 is 143 plus 40 is 183. Maybe I don't want to go all the way to 6. Maybe you get the idea by now. So t of 4 is t of 3 plus my step size times t prime of 3. t of 3 is 183. My step size is still 1. And now my derivative last time is uh, 500 minus 183 is 317. So 317 times 0.1, 1, 1, 
is 31, 34, 35, okay, is 218. Should I keep going, or are we good enough? Yeah. T prime at 3, okay. So T prime at 3 means I know my H is 3, and T of H, I mean H is 3, and that's all I need for this. So I looked at T of 3, I plugged it into the formula, I got a number. And I just keep going this way. If you want to keep going and see what the temperature is after, I mean, maybe you get the idea here. I can keep going, but... Okay, so after four hours, instead of going up 200 degrees, it only went up 168 degrees, and so on. Okay? So, Euler's method is really very straightforward. It's the most simple numerical way of solving a differential equation there is. It's not very accurate, especially if you use a big step size like 1. If the step size gets teeny tiny, then it gets more and more accurate. It's very analogous to doing a numerical integral, remember this stuff, where we take the, uh, what side is that? This side is left. Where we take the left side, this is really the left hand rule. It's almost exactly the same as doing the left hand rule. And the step size h is choosing the width of the rectangles. If we take a tiny, rec with, tiny width of rectangles, you get a good answer. But you have to do a lot of work. There are other numerical methods. Um, I think maybe we may come back to them. There are other numerical methods that, if you remember when we did this stuff, Simpson's rule was much more accurate for the amount of work. There's something that one can do here that's like Simpson's rule, which is called Rungu Kuda. I don't remember if there's an H there. Anyway, it's named after Mr. Runga and Mr. Kuda who came up with it. Um, and it's like Simpson's rule. very close analogy between Simpson's rule and Rogokuda. If you are doing any sort of uh, numerical thing, so like in an engineering class where they have to solve a differential equation, probably they'll use Rogokuda, or they might use a slightly improved version called Rogokuda Felburn. So, there's an L? Yeah, I think so. Later, so this is like from I don't know, the 1940s, and then this is from like the 70s. Mr. Felberg has figured out how to make it a little better. So there's these variations on Rungakuta, which are now about 30, 40 years old, that people use to solve differential equations uh, in computer programs or in engineering simulations or whatever. And there's all sorts of, there's an entire branch of mathematics devoted to doing this kind of stuff called numerical analysis. Uh, so we're not doing that. Okay. So, so fine, this is all good. Let's actually work on solving some differential equations, coming up with formula. You can't always come up with formula. So, so like when I took this class, uh, there, we, we had electricity, but just barely. And we focused a lot on actually writing down solutions rather than thinking about what the solutions are. The problem with that is for most differential equations, you can't really write down the solutions. Just the ones that come up in class. But for those that you can, it's a good thing. So let's work on coming up with some solutions. And let's start with very easy differential equations. So the easiest kind of differential equation to solve is 
called the separable differential equation. And this is when we have something that looks like y prime equals some function of x over some function of y. So for example, y prime equals, let's make the simplest thing we can think of, x over y. The function of x could be a constant like 1. The function of y could be a constant like 1. So if we have something like this, then instead of writing it as y prime, we write it as dy over dx. And then we do something which is actually can be justified mathematically, and I will, but you just forget that it doesn't make any sense. And you treat these things like fractions, and you cross multiply. So I treated dy dx like a fraction, and I cross multiplied. Mathematically, this is just total crap. We can't do this. But it works. And actually, I will justify it in a little bit. But you can do it. Because you really can, even though you can't. And then you just integrate both sides. Assuming you can do the integrals. And this gives you some function of y, of y plus a constant. And this gives me some function of x plus a constant that I solve for y and I'm done. So let me do that in this case. So in this case, I think of this as dy dx equals x over y. I separate the variables. So this becomes y dy equals x dx. <coughs> then I integrate both sides. And when I integrate, I get y squared over 2 equals x squared over 2. And then there's a constant floating around. <coughs> I only have to write one constant because we don't know the value of this constant. So if I wrote plus c1 here and c2 here, then I can just take my constant to be the difference of c1 and c2. So I can just put one constant for the whole equation. OK, and then I can solve. And constants are magical. I can just forget about constants times constants. So I have y squared equals x squared plus 2c, but 2c is really some other k. So the equation, how did this one get in? So the, um, the solution to this then, y squared equals x squared plus a constant. Or y equals, well, something like that. Maybe it's the plus square root, maybe it's the minus square root. It depends on which C you take, what your initial condition is. Okay? Is that the one I was going to do? Well, yeah, sure. Um, so that gives us our solution. If we had an initial condition, like we knew when x was 0, y was negative 1. So let's just augment this a little bit. So I knew that y of 0 is negative 1, then what would the solution be? Nobody knows how to figure that out? Yeah. So we can use this, this equation, to figure out which one it is. So y of 0 is negative 1, so that means negative 1 equals, well, it's plus or it's minus, square root of 0 squared plus some constant. Well, obviously, because this thing is always positive, it better be the minus 1. 
and so C is 1. So my, my equation in this initial value is y of x is negative square root of x squared plus 1. Okay? Alright, let me do another version of this. Uh, yeah, sure. So let me, let me actually just do one where I give you an equation and then I'll do one with an application. Maybe I'll do this one. So, is everybody okay with this? This is really pretty straightforward, pretty easy stuff. The only place where it gets hard is sometimes the integrals get hard. And you have to solve, you have to pay attention a little bit. Oh, maybe I should justify that it's okay? Let me, let me do another example and then I'll just So let's just change this just a little bit. Let's, uh, well, let's say uh, dy dx is x squared y. So this is separable because I can get all the y's over here and get all the x's over here. So divide both sides by y and multiply through by dx. Should I put an initial condition on this? You want one? No? Doesn't matter? Okay. So now we integrate the, yeah. Yeah. So, right. So, if you think about, if you think about this pit, well, almost that picture. When I have an initial condition, it's telling me where to start. There's lots of. So, if I give an initial condition, see, this is not a single curve, right? This is a whole family of curves that look like things like this. And I have to know which one I'm on. So when I said, when x is 0, y is negative 1, that said, I'm here. And then I take this curve. Right? So that tells me which curve I want. If I said, when y is 0, x is 0, then that would give me one of these guys. Well, y is 0, x is 0 doesn't really give me enough information to know whether I want the plus or the minus. But if I said when y is 1, x is 1, that would tell me I was on this one. And so on. So it, it's, it, the initial condition nails down the constant of integration to a specific value. Just like when I did this heating problem, I told you it started at 50 degrees. I would have a different answer if it started at negative 10. Right? Okay. So back to this. So what do we get? We integrate both sides. And so when I integrate this, what's the integral of dy over y? Good. So this is the log of y. And the integral of x squared is x cubed over 3 plus some constant. And now I want to solve for y. So I exponentiate both sides. Oops. Okay. I sort of missed my line a little bit. And I can also, so e to the log of y the absolute value of y. I can clean this up a little bit. When I have a plus in the exponent, it's the same as multiplying. Like that. And c is just some constant. So e to the c is just some constant. It's positive now. 
So I can call it actually A. So I have absolute value of Y is some constant A times E to the X cubed over 3. That means Y is plus or minus some constant A times E to the X cubed over 3. But A is positive, so plus or minus some positive number is a positive number or a negative number. So this is just something times e to the x cubed over 3. So k is any number. Could be plus, could be minus. A was only positive here. Uh, but k could be any. Okay? And again, if we have an initial condition, we can figure out the value of k. I told you when x was 2, y was 3, then we could figure out what a was. Alright? Um, let me do, I guess, one more. These are very easy, so it's, I don't know, is anybody baffled by this at all? So the only time this gets hard is when the integrals get hard. So if you have a, a nasty integral, then, well, Sometimes intervals are hard to do. Um, so, should I do any, another example with some words about it, like voltage in a circuit? Or, huh? Oh, yeah, I was supposed to prove something. Right. Thank you for reminding me. So I want to show that this actually is a reasonable thing to do. Um, so why does this make sense? So we have something like dy dx is f of x over g of x which is the same thing as saying, oops, I guess this was a y, wasn't it? g of y dy dx is f of x. So that's just rewriting it. There's nothing wrong here. What was wrong is sort of putting the dx over here. So suppose that we know We know that the integral of g of y dy is the same as the integral of f of x dx. Because that's what we got out of that, this process here. All right, we do the integrals, and they're going to be equal. Well, what if we take the derivative of both sides of this equation? So if I take the derivative, so I'm also knowing y is some function that depends on x, right? Because that was the whole setup. y is some function depending on x. I don't know what it is, but it depends on x and it satisfies this relationship. So what if I take the derivative of both sides of this with respect to x. So if I take the derivative with respect to x of this thing, g of y dy, then it better equal the derivative with respect to x of the integral of f of x dx because these two things were equal. Okay, well this is just f of x. Here. And if I take the derivative of the integral of g of y with respect to x, I mean, this thing is going to be um, g of y but I have to use the chain rule. Y is a function of X. 
So this is d dx of y. So gy is the derivative of y. gy times the derivative of y is s. In other words, it solves the equation. So that's what I started with. So even though this looks like cheating, in fact, this cheating gives you the right answer because of the change. Sometimes cheating doesn't give you the right answer. You're sitting like behind somebody who's not so smart and doesn't give you the right answer. But this looks like we're doing something not okay, but in fact it is okay. All right. Um, I was going to do a problem with, yeah, that one's boring. I don't want to do that. I was going to do a problem with a circuit and finding the voltage in a circuit. You want me to do that? Yes? Okay. So I'm not going to exactly derive the differential equation. I'll wave my hands about it. So if we have a circuit that looks like, so we have a battery here, and we have a resistor here, and we have a capacitor here, and we have a switch. So this is a battery. So this gives me a charge. This has a resistor, which slows stuff down. This is a capacitor. This is a switch. So if you if you so so uh, Ohm's law says that voltage is capacitance times resistance, and then also using Kirchhoff's law. Using Ohm's law and Kirchhoff's law, you can so, so I'm sorry. This gives me R. This gives me voltage. This gives me inductance. So if I mess around and use Kirchhoff's law, then wait, where did L come from? Uh, huh? Is inductance? Yeah. So why did I call it I? I don't know. I's current. Yeah. Well, anyway. anyway. L and I are related. Well, so anyway, if I get, so I mess around and I get that in such a circuit, L times change in, in inductance plus the resistance times the inductance is going to equal uh, something's wrong here. E. So this is the differential equation that describes, and I seem to have extra stuff. This is the, 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 the differential equation that describes uh, the, the current in this circuit when I close this. Okay? So when I have such a thing, so suppose I had this where this is 12, Ohms, and this is, uh, yeah, why do I have an on hands now? Uh, this is four, what are these, Henry's? Uh, and I put a 60 volt battery over here. Um, then I can figure out what's, uh, so I is in amps, and I want to figure out how this goes. So using this, I can then plug this junk together with that differential equation to figure out what's going to happen to the voltage. So this is E. 
what's going to happen to the voltage in this system, I mean to the, the amps in this system. So it, it'll describe it'll describe the thing. So we can we can write this in this case.
Uh, I'll do one of those on the And then we'll move on.